아고 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 ancestral voices for only the third time it's ever been shown in Ghana. Uh, we had a premiere at Jamestown Cafe two weeks in a row and now we're coming to the Institute of African Studies. The director, Dalian Adolfo, he's based out of the UK, Ghanaian but based in the UK. He'll actually be coming here. We wanted him to be here uh, for this evening's uh, series but he's not able to make it. But he'll be here in December and we'll try to see if we can organize a follow-up on this. But this is a very profound documentary. It goes all throughout the African world. South Africa, Burkina Faso, Cuba, Brazil, US, UK, all over Africa, all over the African world to get practitioners and scholars of African spirituality out of their own mouth. What is it all about? Oftentimes, all we see is Nollywood and it's demonized and so forth and so on. But you'll get a chance to understand the deep thought and deep philosophy of African spiritual systems from the practitioners themselves. So with no further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. And we thank you once again for coming. At the end, we'll conclude with a discussion, a brief discussion, so that we can really see how you've been impacted by this film. So thank you very much. So I want us to uh, open up the floor. Um, for questions, answers, discussions, comments, any ideas, and also to let you know uh, the author Dalian Y. Adolfo, as I mentioned, uh, he'll be coming here, I think, in December. Gautry, is that correct? Yeah, in December. In December. And there's also a companion book that goes along with the documentary where a lot of the similar ideas and concepts are discussed, and hopefully he'll bring copies of those as well, so I'd like to just, uh, from the outset, open up the floor for any discussion, comments, ideas, any clarification, and we'll take it from there. Yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, I think I've enjoyed watching the documentary or the movie. I've enjoyed, and I'm I'm so glad for having this opportunity today because it's like we've all been brainwashed or I've been brainwashed for a very long time. Uh, anything about the African tradition has to do with uh, um, killing uh, um, uh, what we call devil things and all those kind of things. But watching this documentary, I think that if we have a national platform where Every, uh, some, uh, someone somewhere have access to what this film. We will not have thousands of people dying in prayer camps. We will not have uh, thousands of people going to prayer camps for uh, mental or psychological problems. Because watching the documentary, I think there are a lot that we have lost. The African personality have lost. I, I personally have lost so many because I think we have some of these things in my village. And I like the, the one of the persons being interviewed said that there should be a mission where the shrines and altars should be passed to younger generations. We have something like that, but I think the Bible came and took away all of them. I, I, I listened to a story where uh, uh, a tourist had visited uh, the mountain Apajato in Botany, and then he asked the tourist guy who was the, like the tourist guy was giving the historical, historical perspective of the mountain, and said that the first person to have visited the mountain was a German. Meanwhile, he again said that people have been going to the mountain to worship. There's a, the villagers in that area go to the mountain to visit. So if the people have been going there, how come a German came and be the first person to climb the mountain? So it's like, well, in, 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 in short, I think this documentary, I, I, if I, have, I, I need to have a copy. And I think we should 
get a platform where so many people can have access to something like this. It will help the general picture of the African. And also, I think that we, there's, the, there's this uh, debate that our politicians should be swearing by the, our voice. Something like this will encourage them to implement the, the, that perspective of we are the African politicians swearing by the word, the cause of Africa. Thank you. But I wanted to ask, the, the question I wanted to even ask is, it's like the, uh, the, uh, the, the director hasn't given us the life after here. You know, the Bible says that there is hell and there is heaven. But it's like what, what I've been watching, it's like what would we have been brainwashed is that the what we practice or the what the African people practice will lead you to hell. It's like that that's not what I've seen here. So I don't know whether it I have not observed in the world. Do you get the question? Oh. Thank you. Anyone else around and get the floor of Hi everyone, my name is Sedim, and I have to say that this documentary was the best documentary I've ever seen. Yeah, because it touched upon, yeah, it touched upon everything that I know and have been searching for during my awakening experience when it comes to numerology, everything, every single thing, you know, so yeah, my hat's off to who, whoever produced it, the directors, everyone that's in the documentary that spoke the truth because I've, I've read so many books, searched on Google for so many articles and they touched, and this documentary touched upon every single thing, you know, and it's the truth. And oftentimes I, I find that I, I come across people who, you know, they come to me because they see my logs, they see who I am and they want to express their spirituality, but they're afraid, you know, but this is who we are as black people. This is who we are as African people, you know, so we need to learn to um, not hide that part of ourselves, come here and watch a documentary, go home and not take anything out of it. You know, I, I, I highly suggest that we learn from this today and utilize it like you were mentioning, what, what's the practical you know, application of this? They expressed it, <laughs> you know, go and take some salt, put it in the four corners of your room. You know, there, there's so many things that they talked about. You can do your own research, you know, but it, it's time for us to stop hiding and just be ourselves, be yourself. So yeah, I really commemorate whomever made this documentary. It was phenomenal, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Richard Christine. Uh, I want to attempt uh, to enter into the kind of question you asked on whether uh, in the African setting we have the issues of heaven and earth. Uh, I, I, I remember when I was in the training college, I met uh, one man, Vincent Kwadi, who we fondly called Over There. Over There is a story he told us about uh, life after death. And uh, according to him, <clears throat> in our belief system, uh, we don't have issues of uh, uh, heaven or hell. However, Whatever you are doing on earth today, when you die, you go to continue there. <coughs> so he relates the relationship here and there. And so when he is referring to that place, he calls it over there. So it became his name. And we called him over there, over there. Um, the issue is that in Africa uh, cosmology, we have come to leave all that come and follow the Bible because uh, we've been told that what we are uh, uh, worshipping is heightened. The white man came with his religion and some way, somehow, we feel more comfortable identifying ourselves with it than our own culture and heritage. But we are a people who have a beginning 
So if we leave our beginning, then we have lost our very purpose <coughs> as a people. That is what I believe. We've got a spirit that transcends our physical being. That is what happens. You go to these people that worship the uh, ancestral spirits, and uh, when they speak, they are afraid to do certain things because that they know that the consequences of it are very immediate and die. However, you have, like you said, our politicians who swear by the Bible today and tomorrow they will be engaged in very grave, corrupt activities. And they don't fear anything because they know the Bible will not do anything to them. But ask them to swear by the book of <laughs> And they will not. Yes, that is the situation. The spirits are there, they work. But then we don't believe in it. Until we believe in it, we have lost our essence of existence as black people. The healing process is what has just begun. Like my brother uh, said, we need a platform where a lot of people, more than what we have gathered here today, will get to know that Africa, we have got something beyond what we have been taught. Beyond what has been written in the books. Let the lion learn to tell its own tales, lest the hunter will always carry the glory. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, for me, the most, the thing that struck me most about the documentary was like a global Pan-African approach to our spiritual beliefs and thought systems, um, how they looked at pretty much like, they had people from Akan systems, from Yoruba, from also the African diaspora all like pitch their voice in. But in the end you realize that we are all like saying one thing, which I know for me like resonated with me that everything we do, it's always like, no matter where we are, no matter. Um, yeah, someone said can hear from the back. So, so yeah, so, <laughs> okay, I'll start again. I'll say that the thing that resonated well with me was um, how from the documentary, they are pretty documentary to a global pan, global pan African approach. That is, I'm looking at our thoughts, beliefs, spiritual systems um, from a global pan African approach. So you have like people from Akan, Yoruba, from even the African diaspora, um, from South Africa, everywhere, you know, like putting all of these voices together makes you realize that. No matter where, as black people or as African people, we find ourselves, whatever we say or do always like means one thing, which like really resonates with me. Um, on the question of um, what happens in the, in, in the, like when we die or something, I think the documentary kind of like addressed it just a little bit. Um, there was one musician in there who talked about the cyclical process. Um, also, I think Dr. Campbell has also written an article on um, the Bantu. So, yeah, Dr. Campbell has written an article on also the Bantu Cosmogram. I'd advise that you check it out where he also talks about using the Dikenga Cosmogram to show the cyclical process of like life, um, whereby as Africans, you know, we just transform. So, even when we die, we are like the sun, which pretty much like during midnight, you do not see, but we still feel its warmth. We know of the existence. So that's how Africans also, I feel like, tend to think of like life here after that. Even when we are gone, we are not gone, we, you know, and that's why we call libations to um, give credence to all of those spirits that still like reside with us, just like the sun during midnight. Uh, my question would be like to Nana Kwame <laughs> Pebi, um, which is basically like, in the documentary, they mentioned that a name is a code to the soul. And um, I recently also watched a presentation by whereby he talked about naming and what it means for Pan-Africanism. But basically, from your presentation, you could see that many, well, just many people do not tend to have, you know, African names or, and which is like, so my question is like, in set times whereby our parents who are, 
naming us after like European people and all of that, could we still say that those are like codes to our soul or could an African, I don't know, take that name off, take a new African name and would that also change the code to his or her soul? If you could briefly talk about that from your own experience, thank you. Okay, yeah. I just, uh, yeah, um, in relation to the discussion about life after death, there's this uh, one that, there's a poem by Birago Diop um, that I knew about some years ago, and it, it really resonates with much of what has been said, so I thought I'd just share it with, with all of you. It speaks about this idea of death not being the end, but it's just a transformation. So here it goes. Those who are dead are never gone. They are there in the thickening shadow. The dead are not under the earth. They are in the tree that rustles. They are in the wood that groans. They are in the water that sleeps. They are in the heart. They are in the crowd. The dead are not dead. Those who are dead are never gone. They are in the breast of the woman. They are in the child who is wailing and in the firebrand that flames. The dead are not under the earth. They are in the fire that is dying. They are in the grasses that weep. They are in the whimpering rocks. They are in the forest. They are in the house. The dead are not dead. No. That's really Yeah, I think our mic is running out of energy. And as he pulled that up, I also pulled up the exact same thing. Wow. <laughs> wow. So this lets me know that, that huh? <laughs> Good. This lets me know that now will be one to carry on the torch when I am gone because he is <laughs> citing the same form. Um, actually, just last week at the uh, School of Languages conference, I gave a talk on three different things. One was that poem. The talk was in Chi, and it's one of the first times that we're doing scholarly academic presentations in African languages at an African university. Ironic that that needs to be something to be commemorated. But I translated that poem into Chi. Also, there's a song by Ejakonimo, um, and he is a guitarist for those who may not know, and he has a song called Akurad Byakube. Akurai Byakube, which is uh, the father, the older man, uh, plants a coconut tree. And in it, he goes through a story where he says that there was a man who was 98 years old and he decided to go into the back of his house to plant a coconut tree. And a young man came up upon him and said, Oh, Menana, I didn't, I didn't worry. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Because, you know, you won't live long enough to even see this coconut grow. You know, we're the ones who are going to do it. He says, I'm doing it for those who are coming after me. And we tied it to a proverb from ancient Kemet. Over 4,000 years ago, there was a story called a discussion between a man and his own Ba. The Ba, what they translate to as spirit or soul. And there's a conversation where they're discussing the meaning of life. And in it, there's a proverb, Bahert Pu'a which translates to life is a cycle. Life is a cycle. And something that was mentioned several times was this idea of the law of conservation of energy. And that's the same thing that comes out in the poem. The idea is that energy only changes forms. And we can see this as the reason why we do everything we do from libations to funerals to whatever it is, is the idea that even though the sun has set, it doesn't mean the sun no longer <coughs> exists. Even though your ancestor has set, you don't see them with your eye anymore, it doesn't mean that they no longer exist because they exist through the name. As long as their name carries on, they still exist. There's also a proverb, that when a person dies, their tongue doesn't rot. That when a person dies, he hasn't really died, or she hasn't really died. And again, it's the idea that when you bury the person, now you don't see them as like when the sun has set. But you bury them and now a flower grows on the grave where they were buried. 
and then a bee comes and takes some of the pollen from that flower and then it goes and alights on another flower and then that becomes a fruit, a mango. Someone comes and eats the mango, a pregnant woman comes and eats the mango. The mango now becomes part of the growing child. The growing child now comes out and grows up and the cycle continues and continues and continues. He was talking about uh, Professor James Small, who I actually know. He was talking about the human body being made of water. You know, the percentage of water, some say 70%, whatever. But the idea is when you pass on, that water doesn't stop existing. I hope you're following. When you pass on, the water doesn't stop existing, that it will go into the earth, it will evaporate. That exact same water that was in you is now going to be part of the cloud. That exact same cloud is going to turn into rainwater and it's going to come down and become part of a river. That exact same river, they say every river runs to its mother, it will eventually become part of the ocean. And then, then it will continue going on and on and on. So this is the deep, profound knowledge that our ancestors had. But now Europeans come and call it physics and you say, oh, what an amazing idea you have. Energy isn't created or destroyed, it's only transformed. If you think about uh, the names of some of our ancient rulers, like Tutankhamen, his name, his other name was Neb Keporu Ra, Neb Keporu Ra, and it translates to the Lord of all the transformations of the sun. And this is the idea that everything, all of us are made out of stardust. The same thing that the sun is made out of is the same thing that all of us are made out of. <coughs> just in different configurations. So for him to call himself the Lord of all the transformations of the sun, it means of all of us who are yet nothing but transformations of the sun. So these are all of the things. So when we talk about spirituality, it's not, oh, spooky, spooky, spooky. It's very scientific. It's very, it's something that you can understand logically if someone is just there to explain it to you. Unfortunately, we don't have our own practitioners to explain it what we have is Nollywood movies that are out there. You understand? Now look at the difference. Look at Chinese movies. When they talk about their ancient past, they say they could fly through the air and they could shoot an arrow a thousand yards and hit some. They glorify their own past. But what we're taught to do is vilify our own past. And the society that we see around us is the end result of what happens when you vilify your own past. Your roads aren't paved. You have doom, so you have all the things you complain about because what you're telling yourself is that you are not worthwhile. But there are a couple of things that uh, came out and then we'll go back uh, to the audience. One was about names, right? Names and destiny. And that was, you know, the essence of the talk, you know, previously for those who didn't see it, it's online on Abibi Bibi Tumikasa. The mention was we should have our own platforms. We have our own platforms. Unfortunately, we choose to use the white platforms, but there are 100% black owned, black operated, nothing but black platforms that deal with all of these issues. You understand? And one is Abibi Bibi Tumikasa, there are several others. But when we're looking at names, names are tied to a person's inkrabia, which is your destiny, your purpose. So this is why when we talk about Osom or religion or these types of things, it's really not so much in alignment with the African worldview. Because from the African worldview, the reason for being on the planet is for you to realize and attain your destiny. Think about destiny as destination, the place where you're supposed to go. So now your name is something that is to point you towards that direction. All right, so my own name, Abadele, the king arrives at the house. Bakare. Bakare was actually the last ruler of United Kemet and Kush. Glorious is the soul of Ray. Kambon in the spirit of his people is also the name of warrior. So my whole name is pointing me towards what I need to do and how I need to do it. But imagine if your name is uh, Joe McGillicuddy. <laughs> <laughs> what, yeah, something like that. We won't mention anyone's specific name. <laughs> but these are, it, it's, all, it's sort of like a caveman just grunting. And then when they grunt in a specific way, you just know to turn around. But it's not something that's to connect to your own soul and to who you are and to point you to a specific vibration of what you need to be realizing and actualizing. So this is the thing is that basically in many ways when our names are wiped out, they're wiping out our existence through eternity. So when you look at names that are carved in stone, 
four, five thousand years ago, these are people who are still living because their names are still cited. As long as the words that they said are repeated, they are still living on all of these manifestations. But what is going on now is that we're being cut off from that. So when we talk about Black Lives Matter, the police are shooting those of us who are alive, but then there are others who are shooting and killing our ancestors, killing their names off. They're killing those who are already deceased and passed on so that they can't come back. So these are things, I think we'll go back out if we have any other things. Those are just a few reflections of mine. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Once again, thank you for this opportunity. It was actually very educating. Um, first thing I want to talk about, actually, sorry, my name is Yaira. Yaira Zalatu. And um, someone had said something because I was having a discussion with him back in Ohio. And he said, how do you accept someone else's God and expect him to take care of you? You know, thinking about the brainwashing that happened and um, we having to accept the religion that was imposed on us to survive, you know, it's still existence. And unfortunately, a lot of us, you know, a lot of Africans tend to think, and in Africa tend to think that if it's not from the West and it's not by the West, it's not the best. So I feel like, um, as of now, the first thing we need to try to do is try to educate and let us, like, we need to educate our brothers and sisters and let them understand that, um, they're equally capable, if not more, than what they have been brainwashed to think. Because, because, because of that, you already think the Western God is your God, but you had something working for you before they came in. So that's that. Secondly, about the issue of heaven and hell, um, I think I, I maybe I watched in a movie somewhere, but it makes sense because he said that um, whatever you do on Earth, you continue in the afterlife. And the concept of hell, basically, I think, is you living your worst fears till eternity, basically. So if you, um, your physical being is no more, but your soul has to live in another world, and you're being judged based off of how you lived your life, you know, either you become an ancestor or whatever, the, what you fear the most is what you're going to have to live with for the rest of your life. And um, another thing I also realized was that most of the people in the documentary uh, were people who had actually studied and were actually Africans, but did not live in Africa, a, a good majority, because I'm realizing that Africans outside of Africa have had to actually search to find this thing, spirituality, the spirituality of trying to connect um, to the ancestors and all that, because back home, you know, you're Christian, Sunday, you take your clothes, you go to church, it's like, it's a routine, even some people don't know why they're doing what they do, but Sunday you gotta go to church, so you have to be there. So I think that's also another problem, because if those of us outside, because I don't live here, I'm from here, but I'm taking a break for a while, I'll go back to Ohio, but if I don't live here, but it gets me thinking about what works for me, why I'm doing what I do, then I feel like it's a very important part for us to try to educate our brothers and sisters here to understand that what we used to have is actually really great and really strong and it kept us going until we got chopped up into like is it 54 or 56 different countries so i i think that's something we need to really think about and try to find a way to educate our brothers and sisters around Thank you. My, my suggestion is, is is that we should not restrict this research into documentaries and videos we should have a platform, an advocacy platform, that we will come out and be challenging some of what the Western uh, culture is telling us. If, for instance, I'm a Vanda, I was initiated in 2003. You have a group of people who believe in the African culture. We believe that if somebody comes into the University of Ghana, he needs to undergo certain processes in order to, to be excellent. And then someone will sit in another department and say, this is occultism. These students must be arrested. You go to a secondary school where a young guy believes that this is what his grandparents have done. He comes, somebody is sick, he grinds leaves, makes you drink, and then your stomach gets cool. And a lecturer comes or a teacher comes and says, these students are focus. You have to either suspend them or... And then nobody says anything. Mm. And to the best of my knowledge, I can't see anybody <coughs> who has ever been properly initiated on campus here 
the vandal and the person will fail. An example. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, to an extent of even two of them becoming presidents of Ghana. So if occultism or African tradition is bad, we've initiated them. They are now ruling us. So let's get the platform to advocate, to defend some of our brothers who practice some of these things in the schools and people try to make them so black and dirty, say you are an occult, you don't have to practice this. Now on campus, they've restricted most of these activities. You do it, they suspend you. But if they properly initiate you, you pass, you get a first class. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, I have a question. Um, once we were watching the documentary, well, we were told that um, African tradition does not have a history of murder in the name of our God. But then, once upon a time, I was told, or I learned, that the Abuache Festival came about as a result of human sacrifices, which later on um, became sacrifices of four other animals and then to a deer or an antelope. So how true is this? I want to know. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Honestly, I'm a Christian, and honestly, I'm opposed to most of the things which you said. But then, let me focus on the positive side of this documentary. Um, like most of these, <laughs> 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 like most of you said, um, this documentary has changed my perception of certain things. Most of the values of African people are very positive, talking about not thinking bad of people, praying. And I saw some similarities in some of the things Africans teach and some of the things that are taught in churches. Um, so that is what has changed. Um, actually, I saw it as very demonic, it's all involving blood, shed, and because of the um, imagery we see on, on, on movies, all the African movies, like all the African movies that what you see, all of these things. So it gives it some kind of perception. Uh, one, one thing that also um, actually brought me to this conference was how the African culture is meddling with Christianity. And I realize that most of those people I see on TV, their Christianity isn't pure Christianity. The Christianity has been influenced by the African culture. It's like that I sit down and you don't see a difference. Today, they divine and they tell you it's prophecy. They come to speak on radio and say all sorts of things again. The is not correct in the first place. I don't see the linkage with African whatever. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a waste of time because. <laughs> yeah. Because in the documentary, they talk about divination, and so some of those things are real. And then sometimes, too, there are instances where some of these same people who go to the shrines of this African or this spiritualist for some spiritual power, and they come and deceive people that it's from the God they said. So that was my point of interest. But then also, coming back to the things which you said about the Western God. Christianity is not the faith of the West. Christianity is, or it came out of Judaism, which has nothing to do with the West. That's specifically in Israel. Now, Christianity has not only opposed the African faith, it has opposed every single religious Christ on the face of the earth. From Buddhism to um, Buddhist, um, Hindus, communists, and all other things. So it has not only opposed the African faith, it has trumped all religions on the face of the earth. And it has been able to penetrate every single religious organization because of how powerful it is. In the midst of all the empty philosophy of all the religions, none has been able to oppose anybody they're able to accept it, it's able to transform their lives. And being a Christian is a... See, this is what our ancestors did to allow those crazy ones to come in our lives. Just allow him. Being a Christian exactly. <laughs> it doesn't really have to do with mere intellectual concept. Yeah. 
There are a whole lot of philosophies to explain how you become a Christian. It's a whole doctrine of election. Okay? With them to become Christians by human effort. It is God appointing you to become. That's what we call you the elect. What does God look like? <laughs> no, I'm serious. No, does he look please. like Can I if just Jesus along? Christ is the, yeah, is the picture, yeah, does God look like his he's, son? He's, 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 is God a white man with the yeah, eyes and the hair? Let's try to deal with some of these things because I think you're getting some responses already. <laughs> but you are mentioning something about pure Christianity. I, I want you to look at Psalm 104 and I want you to compare it to the hymn to the Aten. Hymn to the Aten was composed by Akhenaten and what you'll find is that Psalm 104 is plagiarized wholesale from the hymn to the Aten. I also want you to look at Proverbs and compare it to the book of Aminamope which preceded it by hundreds of years. What you'll find is even biblical scholars acknowledge that all of these proverbs that are attributed to Solomon actually are coming from the proverbs of Aminamope. Have you heard of Aminamope before? All right. Have you heard of the hymn to the Aten? Right. So when you're talking about pure Christianity, what you're actually talking about is plagiarism of African spiritual texts. When they're talking about you know, these African uh, concepts or Christian concepts, I also want you to look up the Council of Nicaea have you heard of that one? This is where Constantine and others, they called together elders to decide what things that they were going to allow to be the canon of Christianity and which ones they were going to keep out. So all of these ideas of parting the Red Sea, you will find it in text written in Kemet, the land of black people, thousands of years before. When you're talking about Holy Trinity, you can go to the oldest religious text in the history of the entire world called the Pyramid Text and you will find where they got the concept of Holy Trinity from because at that time it was Osar, Oset, and Heru, the father, the mother, and the child. So if Jesus ever existed, he would go and read his entire life story carved into stone thousands of years before he ever existed. So what I'm doing is I'm giving you information. I don't want to attack you in any way, shape, or form, but it's very clear that you haven't heard of any of this information before and that's calculated and it's intentional. So please put your hand down, I'm trying to inform you. There's something that's trying to block and I'm trying to let you have the words of your own ancestors because whoever was trying to make sure you were ignorant of Aminemope, they were doing it because they had a specific goal in mind so that you would come into a setting like this and you would start talking about things without knowing what you were talking about. So I want you to know the words of your own ancestors. So all these concepts, when we were talking about the uh, afterlife, so in the pyramid text, and that was mentioned briefly before, this is the oldest corpus of religious text, spiritual text in the history of the entire planet Earth. All of these concepts, the, con the concept of Judgment Day, it did not come out of Israel. It came because the Hyksos came and invaded Kemet, and then they were driven out by Yamos. That's the one who you call Moses, right? But Yamos was an African person. You can go and see his body still there embalmed in the museum in Luxor to this very day. That's the one who drove them out. So the fact that they have all of this information that they plagiarize is because they came as invaders and were driven out of there. But to come back to the uh, judgment day, you have the idea that when a person dies, their heart is weighed against the scale, of, against the feather of Ma'at on the scale of Ma'at. So what is Ma'at? Ma'at is the world's first moral and legal code in the history of the entire planet Earth. It had to do with truth, justice, righteousness, harmony, balance, order, reciprocity. So what you had to do is not the 10 commandments because they only plagiarized 10 out of the 42. Did you know there were 42 of them? I know there are 10 and there are only 10. That's exactly. Those are the ones that the Eurasians said that they would be able to abide by, but there are 42 of them. They only took the 10 that they felt like they could deal with. So what you would do is that in the afterlife, this is at the time of the pyramid text, is that when your heart was being weighed, you had to say all the things that you have not done, that you have not committed murder, that you have not stolen, that you have not done all of the things that you only know 10 out of. There are 32 other ones that you should research and find out because it's all over and everyone knows this except for the African person. 
how come you are African, your own ancestors invented 42, and you only know the 10 that the Eurasians were able to come up with and abide by? This is a question I want you to ask yourself, and I want you to go and read the other 32. You understand? So I've given you some information. It's on the wall downstairs even. It's actually now at the children's school. Oh, we removed it. Took it. Yeah, no, but no. if you go online, you can read it in Medunetra. That's the original text that it was written in, in the world's oldest writing system. How many people knew that African people invented writing? Good, you've been here at African Studies or you've been doing your own research. Very good. So when we invented writing, we had all of this information there. So you can either get it in the original text or you can get it in translation. You understand? So all of this is information that will help to open your eyes. So this is at the time of the pyramid text. And at the time of the pyramid text, the idea was that the afterworld, we want our ruler to go to the imperishable stars. So you have stars that rise and set and rise and set perceptibly from the human eye. But then there are those at the northern pole and those never set. Those are the ones that never die. So the idea was let's build pyramids and make them in alignment with those stars so the ruler can go and join those. Now, after that, you have the time of the coffin text, and then the idea started to shift away from the afterlife being up to the afterlife being down. Everyone eventually gets buried. There are still concepts of the imperishable stars and going to join them. But when they talk about the afterlife, there are certain things that you would say so that you wouldn't have to go upside down. The idea is that the way we live now, this is in the realm of the living. The realm of those who are not living must be the exact opposite. So when you go to the coffin text, there are certain things that you would say so that you don't have to walk upside down because if we're walking here, there it must be the opposite. Again, think about the philosophy. If we're living and this is the opposite of life, then everything there must be the opposite. You understand? There was even the concept of here we eat food and we defecate feces. The idea was we want to say things so that we don't have to eat feces and defecate food. Now that sounds very weird until you start thinking about all of our ancestors, we bury them in the ground. And we want crops to grow. What do we put on the crops? What do we put into that same earth? Fertilizer. Right? So you put this into the realm of the abode, and then what comes back up is the food. You take in the food, and you give that out. And again, it's coming back to this idea that life is a cycle, and they're just complements of each other. So my friend, you, you've got some research to do. You've got some research to do. There's a lot you don't know. Please sit down. <laughs> we, we gave you plenty of time. Plenty of time. Plenty of time. More than some people wanted to say. So let's hear those who have known. Yeah, let's go to so others. Please, please, I'm sorry. Say them, we'll come to you. OK, you go ahead. And then. Please, those of you who want to speak, we'll check this out. All right, say them. OK, well, I'm going to say something that's going to throw off all the spiritual people here, which is that I personally believe that religion can be a pathway to enlightenment so if you want to remain christian you can use your african self your african spirituality to to understand how to use the bible and christianity to enlighten yourself now you're gonna have to you know drop the opinions of your pastor and whomever and just follow your intuition like Psalms, for example, you read the Psalms, it's like codes. Everything is science. You read the Psalms, the verses. Once you understand what those quotes mean, you're able to internalize it and use your intuition to draw forth information from, you know, the, the pool of all information, you know, so that you can come to your own conclusion and understanding of things. You know, so I don't shun religion, you know, because at the end of the day, people, truth is inherent, you know, to, to somebody, a nine is a nine if they're looking at it from their perspective, but for, from a per the person standing on the opposite end, it would look like a six, you know what I'm saying? So I'm not gonna judge you for being a Christian because at the end of the day, people are just trying to be good. You know, and Islam, uh, Christianity, you can use it to enlightenment, to enlighten yourself, but to a certain extent. You cannot 
go beyond to a higher level that's what i have to say and then initially i wanted to touch upon yao's question with the names which is that we have to look at it from the numerology perspective you know even in dna uh, metaphysics they say dna um is the way it is based on switches the on and off switches you know and we under we can understand it from that metaphys metaphysical perspective of the zeros and the ones you know so if even if you're given a name like some crazy name like kiss me for example i saw on maury you know they, the person named her daughter kiss me everything is for a reason like the high priestess was saying in the video nothing is for no reason if your parent rejected you or you were born on the way to the hospital it was for a reason so if your name is michael it is for a reason and you can use etymology to break down you know why you are named that name and use it to you know for you to understand more of your destiny you know i it's difficult for me to put it into words but it's like i understand that everything is for a reason and it it all comes down to numerologies the zeros and the ones you know so yeah, even if you have a European name, you can still use etymology to break down why your name is Michael. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so many things to say, but I just want to respond and, to... And for those, if anyone is able to stay at the end, we also want to take a group photograph. So if you don't run away, we'll be wrapping up very soon. Yeah, my born in Jamaica, got a slave name. I got rid of it when I became conscious. My name is Yahoo Suachim. And I can't see the relevance of us worshiping or the people who oppressed us, murdered us. We honor them every time we have their name. It bothers me up to this day when black people have white names. It doesn't make sense. You're honoring the people who oppress you. Um, so if my name is Michael, it's because a slave master gave that name to my, forced it on my, on my, on my, my people. Why am I gonna, find value in that and then pass it on to my children. No, you're crazy. I mean, not you, but <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, this morning a good friend of mine called me. I got him to re read a book called The Black Jacobin. If you've never read that book, please do. Um, Black Jacobin, C.L.R. James, um, written about the, the Asian Revolution, 1804, became the first independent country. Um, and what happened was they, they defeated Spain, England, and France at a time that was the three most powerful um, powers in the world. And this little country, Haiti, defeated them. What did they use? They used the religion of their ancestors, voodoo, which were taught that is bad. My brother over there, the Christian guy, would say, oh, it's devil worship. But they used that religion, that knowledge, and freed themselves from their slave masters um, grip and my point is if something isn't working for you you need to throw it away Christianity is not working for us as a people in this continent um, you have more churches in Ghana um, in Jamaica you have more churches on the corner than, than, than you have schools and but it, look how we're living in Europe the churches are empty nobody white folks are not going to church anymore and who's, who's coming to church? The black folks taking over the, 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 these institutions. It's not working for us, folks, so you need to, we need to get rid of it. You can't even find a, a woman. You want to marry a, 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 a sister here, for the most part, and she's Christian, and you don't want Christian. You can't find a good woman who believes in her African tradition. You can't. Everybody's Christian. You know? Yeah, it's, you can't. So um, I, I do business, and I've had... I'll give you one story. I met a brother. Someone gave me a uh, name of someone to contact. We had a business deal going to do. And I was happened to fast on that day. The 19th, I fast to remember the ancestors. He's a pastor and he fasts. So when he asked me why I fasted, I told him. You know, he went back and told the person who referred to me that he, um, he couldn't do the deal with me because I'm not a Christian. What's that got to do with, 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 the, with the business? But he rejected. I'm embracing my ancestors, he's rejecting them in the name of that guy's God that just went through the door. So people, if it ain't working for us, we need to get back to where 
to, to, to our ways of our ancestors. I know I'm talking a lot, but thank you. All right. One of the things I was was touched by in the film is the the how it can help move the belief systems can help move people back to a space of naturalness. It wasn't this okay. Let's go here every Saturday, every Wednesday at this time, and then do these things and say it this way. You know, stand up, sit down, fight, 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 walk this way, talk this way, eat this way. But it was really a movement to get people back to their natural inclinations and the, being attuned to their natural rhythms and a natural cycle and talking about how we learn from nature, we learn from plants, we learn from animals. And, and there was a, there was a, I don't know if anybody said the word love, maybe they did and I was just so caught up I didn't hear it, but it felt loving. Uh, that type of an approach, that type of peaceableness, that type of, of, of penchant for synergy with one's surroundings, not that there's nature and then there's us, but we are nature. So I really appreciated the elegance and the sophistication that was uh, brought forth in the ideals of these different spiritual systems and these beliefs and I was grateful for the people who were able to articulate it. I think for those who are practitioners and Brother Small said it well when he said this isn't for everybody when we're talking about these types of things. These are, these are providers. These are spiritual service providers and not just people who are just doing their life. Everybody doesn't have to go and get initiated and then become this this is for people who are, for lack of a better term, who are called. And I like that distinction that he made because it's, which of us go and see an attorney every week? Which of us go and see a dentist every week? Which of us go and see an OBGYN every week? You go when you have need for it. And, and I like that natural approach to it. But I think the distinction is that sometimes we're not always able to separate the sophistication and elegance of the ideal, which has the capacity to reset us to our original factory settings against the backdrop of the misconduct, the unethical behavior. The person who is the babalao, the person who is the uh, spiritual leader, but who's engaged in bad conduct. And so it begins to make it difficult to, to, te to tease it out sometimes and then we just kind of say, well, that's just as bad as the Catholics. That's just as bad as this. Or else we'll say there was human sacrifice over here, and I knew that was going to come up. Um, but we ignore all the human sacrifices under the auspices of Catholicism and Christianity. And we ignore the bloodiness of, of, of Judaism, where they are just sacked, the just blood of animals, just like a... a, 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 a a, a lake. <laughs> it's just, it's just, you know, it's just mind-boggling. So that's the thing that I really appreciated so much was how, how the belief systems really cultivated. You know, you don't have to go here every Thursday and get this many CDs, and you know, we're going to do round three of offerings and whatever. <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it's like no, just kind of live your life right. Be right to animals. Be right to the soil. Be right to the air. Be right to the water be right to each other. And it was brought forth really beautiful um, in this movie. And yes, again, I want to echo Sedim. This is remarkable. Um, and I'm really uh, pleased and impressed that, it, that it's shown here. And I can only hope, as a result, that we don't leave from here with a great conversation, or we don't leave from here thinking about that one guy, but that we leave here thinking about how many people can we forward this film out to. May I? Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I really, I really enjoyed the conversation. I followed uh, the documentary. The documentary maker is a friend of mine, Dalian, Dalian Adafo. Uh, and yeah, I've also enjoyed all the questions. Of course, with a short, what, a short-ish documentary, we can never get all the answers to everything. Um, yeah. Just to give it some context, this documentary is the sequel to the documentary that came before it. So this one specifically was called Dali, uh, Ancestral Voices, Spirit is Eternal. The first part was, I can't remember the, the title of the first one, um, but uh, yeah, like uh, 
Dr. Camborn mentioned at the beginning, the documentary really should come next month. And we're hoping that he'll bring some more copies of the book and some more copies of uh, the, the documentary you've just seen and also part one. So if you want to get more information, let me know. I'll get your name added to uh, our list. Uh, and meanwhile as well, you can then go online. Uh, there's a Facebook group and those of whom of you are not on Facebook, uh, as has been mentioned, there are African platforms where direct information from the, the, the documentary makers available or indirect information about African belief systems, questions you might have that of course we can't, that won't be answered here today and you can get information. Um, and then one, one, one comment I wanted to make was, uh, I guess, around the question about heaven, the question about uh, sacrifices, uh, as much as we can't answer all of them now, to keep in mind that yes, as the sister also said, this shouldn't be a one-off event for any of us. We should take our questions, our thoughts, and go and do our own research. We have to get out of the mindset of thinking that everything, all answers can be put in one book universally and all the answers will be there and delivered to our doorstep. Because while we think things will be easy and come to us easy, people are going to exploit us come to give us answers that we that we want. We want answers, nice, simple answers. People are going to say they have those answers when they don't. When we appreciate the struggle, not only political, active struggle, but the struggle mentally to teach ourselves what we are, nobody can come and exploit us because they will know that whatever they tell us, we're going to leave that place and learn more, go and study more, ask more people, go on the internet, go to libraries, whatever it takes to find out more about ourselves and not take any one person's answer. So yeah, if the documentary maker was here, he'd be able to give you some more answers. He'd be able to direct it to more writers and things. But at the end of the day, that would just be, that always be the beginning for more struggle, more research that we have to do to find those answers. Because my answer won't be your answer and your answer won't be the next person's answer. So it has to be continued like that. We have to treasure the struggle of learning about who we are and finding our own answers for ourselves because those answers can also change after time mm -hmm. as well. Yes. So we can't hear any more stuff to so. Yes, I wanted to um, ask how do we get the documentary that we just saw? Because I came here 11 months ago specifically to engage in African spirituality but it's been just overwhelming to like, where do you start? And so what, um, what I took away, the, the big takeaway I got from the film was the lady saying, and the gentleman saying, you know, a candle and some water. Mm -hmm. Something that simple is where I needed to, so now at least I have a starting point. Because my daunting fear was me going to a priestess or something and having this whole ritual done and me not knowing anything and just feeling like, okay, I'm here getting prayed over by a priest and I have no idea what's going on. So at least now I feel like I have some control and where to start, you know? And so, I mean, I know that it's gonna be more and more me delving into my um, ancestral um, self, as the brother was saying, because all of this is just me learning me. Uh, because all of this is my ancestors, my ancestors in my DNA. I just, I'm just so glad that now I have a starting point with the water and the fire, and then my ancestors, my grandmother, and my grandfather, on this little altar that I can hear my grandmother telling me how to work these things through because that's what she did all my life. Wow. That, that's very good, and to me, that's really the transformation we like to see of behavior. It's not, oh, I just learned this and now let me go home. No, anything you learn should have a behavioral correlate. What should I do now differently in my life based on this new knowledge? Um, I wanted to touch on a few things, some of the things that were asked and we didn't get a chance to because we started dealing with other things. Um, but there is a quote by Malcolm X where he talks about if you have, if you are being lynched, and you're praying to this white man's God and the white man is praying to the white man's God, who do you think? <laughs> who do you think the white man's God is going to listen to? I, I think you're going to get, you know, hung. 
that's one piece. Another thing is the point that came up about numerology and things of this nature and things being for a reason. I wanted to give a, a different idea that sometimes we think that anything white people do is divine and that if they did it, then it must be for a reason and therefore it's good. So when you changed your name, wasn't that also for a reason? Why would we elevate their giving you the name Michael over you also doing something for a reason, which was to reclaim your own African name? We also have to look at, if you look at the people who invented the calendar, there were 12 months in the year, we're talking about Kemet. There were 12 months in the year and every single month had 30 days. And then there were five days as festival days at the end. And that was around the time of July, August, and now we still do it. Even at Udra Festival or home, it's a continuation of that tradition. So we don't see the new year as being December or January. No, it's still along those same lines. So now if we're calculating numbers, what if we're calculating numbers based on something that some white people decided to do? And saying, well, they decided to do it for a reason. Yes, they decided to do it because they decided to wipe away all the true knowledge that was there before. So also for a reason, you can decide to go and reclaim that. So if we're calculating all of our things based on incorrect numbers that a white man named Gregory decided to do, our calculations may be off. So it's like an accountant. I've given you all the wrong books. And now you come up with a calculation at the end and all of your calculations are off because you don't know that what is supposed to be is 30. So if you go back to the 30-day calendar, you understand, you're also doing it for a reason. So if we are raised in the idea that anything white people do is divine and that's for a reason, whatever, then we'll have a very hard time doing something that's even more intelligent. So if there are benefits in doing what's wrong, imagine the benefits that could accrue to you for doing what's right, which is also for Also the idea of sacrifice and murder, things of that nature. There are several traditions where if the ruler dies, that there are sac human sacrifices that are done around that time, usually within the household and things of that nature. And in certain cultures like Yoruba cultures, other cultures, that oftentimes that came about for also a reason, that you would have times where this ruler dies under perhaps mysteri mysterious circumstances. It may be poisoning, it may be whatever. The next one ascends to the throne, that one also dies. The next one come, that one also dies. We have actual historical circumstances of Aminemhat, the first, which was a ruler in ancient Kemet, Ramesu Sumer Amun, also known as Ramesses the third. These rulers who were murdered, you know, they were assassinated actually. Now, what you would see is a remedy to that is saying that everyone within the household also will go with them. Now these people will no longer be the ones who may be doing things against the ruler. They have a vested interest in making sure that the ruler lives long and has longevity. Even in Equipim to this day, they still have what's called Akrahene. So the Okra of the ruler is seen as being the soul of that ruler that anything that happens, that person eats. If the ruler eats, that person eats. If the ruler passes, that person passes. Let's say they don't do it anymore. I actually know someone who's the ak Akrahene. <laughs> I've been mom and they say they don't do it anymore. But one of the ideas and the logic behind it is that this person is now somebody who has a vested interest in making sure that this ruler isn't poisoned. So oftentimes the, the ruler will be killed in a plot that's internal to the household. So if you read up on Ramesses III, they have what's called the harem plot. And there were so many people who were inside the royal palace who were the ones who were responsible for you know killing him. I'm in hot his uh, instruction to sin was read. You can read all of the things about don't trust the people around you and those types of things. So my encouragement would be to go and see the reasons why in societies that do that, not every society did that. Not every society had rulers. You had acephalous structures, the Igbo, the Dagare speakers, all of these types of people. So in some places in Africa, they did this. In other places in Africa, they didn't do this. In the places that did it, try to understand why they did it. And it's not to say it's good or bad or we should do it or we shouldn't do it, but it will at least help you to understand what was the logical process that made them decide to do that. In other places that didn't do that, think about what were the logical processes that made them decide that they don't want to do that and take it from there. And then from us also as Africans, then we can say, based on what we know to be true, this is what we need to do to move forward, right? Um, 
Also, someone mentioned Vandals, right? Is he, is he still here? The Vandal? Do you know who the Vandals were? Do you know who the actual historical Vandals were? This was a group of Germanic speakers who came and ransacked all throughout Europe until they came to North Africa and then they desecrated the temples, the shrines of Kemet and all over North Africa. So when the term vandalism comes about, you're talking about here are white Germanic people who are coming into Africa and destroying the history that your ancestors carved in stone for you. So I always lament when I see black people who call themselves vandals or any other type of white people Vikings. because Vikings, because I say these are people who have absolutely no idea who they are. So it's not to say that whatever initiations, I don't know what has done for you in your own life, but the fact that you are calling yourself, not you, the fact that someone will call themselves a vandal and don't know who the historical vandals were, especially where in African studies, who were they in relation to African people? Did they vandalize the things that your ancestors carved in stone for you to be able to learn from? And if so, why would I call myself that? Why wouldn't I call myself Kush? Right? You could say, well, we're calling ourselves vandals for a reason. Perhaps it's not a good reason, though. And you may have a better reason to call yourself Kush or Meroe or Aksum or any of our great civilizations. You understand? So this is just an alternative. I wanted to touch on that. And the first book was Ancestral Voices, Esoteric African Knowledge. So you can also find that one online. The author will be coming uh, here as well. Wait, you mean first movie or first book? Book. So that's African esoteric. So the first, the first documentary, African esoteric knowledge, Afri uh, ancestral voices, uh, esoteric African knowledge, and you can find that. I believe you can find it online. But if he's bringing actual copies, then that would be the best way to get it. It's directly from him. So what we watch tonight is online. Can I just go online and see it? Or where do I get it? I need it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you go to get the second one, this one that's just out now, if you get it on Vimeo. So, yeah, like I said, those of you who are online, you Google this documentary you just watched today, you can get that one on Vimeo. The first one, though, that came out 2011, that one's not available online. So if you're interested in the first one, like I said, he's coming next month, and he send it, he will be coming with a uh, documentary. So, yeah, like I said, give me your, your name and contacts. If you want the first documentary and the book, and for those of you who've got, I'm hearing some international accents in here, so those of you who've got PayPal's and Amazon's and things, you can get that online at the book. Yeah, so I think we'll bring it to a close, and do you have something before we close? And yeah, we want to take a photo of your photo, you don't run out after he gets done talking, please. Yeah, concerning uh, vandalism, um, we don't call ourselves Vandals based on that history. Uh, we have our own thing. Uh, we believe in Father Bacchus, who is the god of fertility, right. agriculture, and stuff like that. Sex. Bacchus is taken from Greek, history. Greek, and Roman. 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 Sex wine. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just to rectify that, we don't believe in those Vandals. We believe in our own Vandals, Bacchus, fertility, agriculture. That's even what you brought in is even more problematic. <laughs> <laughs> Bacchus is now a Greek god. Why are you believing in Greek gods? So my whole point is, one, you're naming yourself after a group of white people who destroyed African property. They came into North Africa and destroyed African property. That's where the term vandalism comes from. That's one. And then two, Bacchus. This is a Greek god. There's also a store called Bacchus here where they sell wine and spirits and other things of that nature. So what we do in all of these things, they tell you that what you do is paganism and fetishism. But if you look up the etymology of the word Wednesday, you understand, of Friday, of January, of February, of all of these, you're talking about Thursday. Thor's day, right? Saturn's day, you understand? Every single thing that you do, you're saying, let's stop doing this African thing because it's heathen, pagan. But all these things, now you have given up your own African things and now you're worshiping and giving reverence to the things of your enemies. And this is what my uh, brother here, Yah, was talking about. So you can say, yes, I'm doing it for a reason or whatever. You could also do something African for a reason. You understand? So you brought in something a bit more problematic. I hope the man are not to have. 
it's, it's, it's not to pick on vandals. It's, it's talking about when you name yourself after your enemies. You understand? That may not be the best thing for you as an African person. If there are any benefits from naming yourself after your enemy, imagine how many more benefits it would be to name yourself after your own ancestors. If there are benefits for worshiping the gods of your enemies, imagine how many more benefits there would be for worshiping or let's say giving reverence to your own African ancestral spirits. Because again, worship isn't even the point of you being on the planet, it's for you to attain your destiny. And then these various spirits can help you to attain your destiny, right? So just food for thought, not don't yeah, go to yeah, Commonwealth yeah. Hall so anymore. Our uh, Commonwealth brothers, you can share this piece of history of the name Vanda <laughs> with the various. Just let me add to it. I just want to add. We all, we have our God. We call him Kuzunik, and we have a song we sing for him, Glorious Kuzunik. Every time, anytime there's a procession, anytime there's any event in Achimota. I mean, it's just some of the ways that. They tell us how God or whatever we do is wrong, but go around and give you something that you should worship, even when setting up the educational institutions. So, backers, we come and can relate to that in Achimota, we have to yeah, These are all colonial Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so it's, you know, yeah. It's, it's always there. But the mm -hmm. history is surprising. Yeah. Right? Especially if you hold it there. So, make use of the history and share it, and who knows? In the next decade, Kumos will drop the name Vanda for something African. Yeah. And Gandhi must fall, Vandal must fall. <laughs> Vandal must fall. Okay, so let's take the group picture. Since we are talking about our history and etymology, uh, what's the, uh, the root of Africa? Oh, are you leaving? We are taking a group picture. The root of Africa. Please don't go. Just. I, I, I want to find. Ask your question as we go to the front. Yeah. People are like itchy and they're hungry and they're sleepy. So, everyone, if you can come to the front, we'll take the group picture. <laughs> you want to see me in class? So, what the root of the word Africa? This sitting dope, which is. Where you take one small piece, you generalize the whole thing. So there was a northern province in Waswati, in Asia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah.